So the next topic we're going to we're going to discuss is uh, the limping child, which is uh, one of the more common things that we see in the office, and that I'm sure that you guys see in the office as well. Um, so the first thing we ask is, well, what is a limp? Um, and so if you look up the definition, it's any abnormality of gait, which really doesn't help us very much. So you got to understand a little bit about gait um, and how we walk. So gait is divided into stance phase and swing phase. Stance phase is when your foot is actually on the ground. Swing phase is when the foot's off the ground. And that's about a 60-40 split. And so when we're talking about a limp, I tend to think about it in two different ways. One is an antalgic gait or a painful uh, gait. And that's shortened stance uh, sh shortened stance phase on the affected leg. So basically, they're just not wanting to put as much weight on that leg for as long a period of time. And that's to avoid pain. And with kids, especially young kids, they might just refuse to walk because they don't want to feel pain. Um, and then the other version of a limp is a Trendelenburg gait. That's really due to weak abductors. And so if the abductors are weak, as you walk to keep your center of gravity so you don't fall to the opposite side, you lean the body over, and that's more of like a lurching kind of gait. And it's not always painful. So then when we see a limping kid or we hear about a limping kid, there are basically five things that I want to know. And, and, and that's really because the differential diagnosis is so vast, and I'm trying to kind of funnel it down and hone it in. So when I think about them, I'm thinking about, okay, what's the age of the kid? Um, how long has this been going on? Where is it? How bad is it? And is it painful or is it non-painful? Um, and if you can kind of get an answer to all those things and put it into your mental computer, it usually spits out two or three things that it can be. And again, the differential diagnosis, this is, there's like 30 things on this list. Um, but I can probably think about, about 30 more. Um, and so what are we going to talk about today? What do we really need to know about? So out of that list, um, these are probably the most, either the most common or the most important things because they're things you don't want to miss. And so we're going to talk about skiffy, perthes, and toddler's fracture later on in the day uh, in various talks. So I'm going to leave those a little bit alone. And we're going to really focus here on infection um, and then infection mimickers. Um, and that's what we kind of need to know here. So how do we figure it out? The majority of it, like everything else um, in medicine, you know, 90% of it is uh, the history. So if you ask the right questions, you can really usually get it pretty close uh, to, to what it is. And then, obviously, when in doubt, examine the patient. I can't stress how important that is. Sometimes just by taking one quick, quick peek at a patient, and especially you, got, you ER guys really know this, you have your gestalt as soon as you see the patient. is like, is this bad? Is this not bad? Um, and so the typical situation is, you know, the ER calls, you're on call, and they say, I've got a kid with a limp. All right, so I'm keeping those, th those five things we talked about in mind. And so we start having the discussion. Well, okay, how old's the kid? Okay, they're about 20 months, you know, a year and a half or so. Um, and, well, how, when, when did this start? You know, and they tell me it started about three to go, days ago, but, you know, it got worse, and, and that's what brought the family in. And, well, where do you think it's coming from? Because sometimes it's really hard to tell the location of the pain, especially in really young kids. Is it the hip? Is it the knee? Is it the femur? Um, but they, you can usually get it, get it in the ballpark. And so, you know, the resident or fellow says, well, anytime I move the hip, the kid goes nuts. He screams. And then, so, you know, this is, has my interest peaked a little bit. I'm a little bit jazzed up about this one because I've got things that I'm thinking about and that I'm worried about. So I run over to the ER, and then you look at the kid. And this is what you see. And you see a kid with a, that's clearly, like, really uncomfortable, uh, may look sick, and that left leg is held in a flexed and abducted, externally rotated position. And I can, without even seeing labs or any imaging, I can pretty much guarantee you this is going to be a septic arthritis of the head. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about septic arthritis. And we're really going to divide that into the hip and then kind of like all the other joints, sort of because of anatomy. The hip is obviously a deeper structure. So uh, the diagnosis can be a little bit, the way we go about diagnosing it can be a little bit different. 
We're going to briefly touch on osteomyelitis, but Dr. Gagliardo in the next topic is going to uh, really get into that more. And then we're kind of talk about like the combo situation between septic arthritis and osteo. And then we're also going to talk about kind of like the great mimicker, what we are always trying to figure out. Is this a toxic synovitis or is this an actual bacterial infection? So with septic arthritis, the most common locations are going to be the hip and the knee. And most of the hip infections are going to be in kids under two years of age. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen elsewhere. These are just the most common. But we do also see it in the ankle, in the shoulder, in the elbow particularly. And you get this infection. Usually it's going to be a hematogenous spread. It can be continuous from uh, a metaphyseal osteomyelitis. Um, and then a little bit more unusual uh, is going to be just a direct uh, inoculation or direct contamination from either trauma or surgery. And in terms of hip septic arthritis, not all the other septic arthritis, but early on, um, it's going to be the limping child. It's going to be the kid who comes in, doesn't really want to put weight on it, but will put weight on it. And then a little bit later on in the course, that's when we're talking more about the, uh, the immobile child or the child who just won't walk. And on exam, this is very classic. Again, this flexed, externally rotated, and abducted hip. Um, kids assume this position because it expands the joint capsule, so there's basically more room for pus to, uh, to, to gather. Um, and then one of my mentors kind of taught me this thing he termed the bed bump test. If you walk by the bed and you, and you bump the bed and the kid screams, that's kind of indicative of a more severe course, and that's septic arthritis kind of until proven otherwise. And a lot of the times these kids, you just get that gestalt. You look at them, you're like, oh, this kid doesn't look good. They look sick. They look toxic. And so the diagnosis, again, it's primarily clinical, but we all like numbers. We like, you know, a little bit more um, evidence as to why we're doing what we're doing. So Min Coker, who's probably one of the most famous pediatric orthopedists, developed uh, some criteria actually when he was a med student, I believe, um, to, to sort of give us a, a little bit of an algorithm for, you know, when you're looking at a kid, what things can we look at to tell us what's the percentage that they're going to have a septic arthritis. So he, th he looked at four parameters. Uh, the ability or inability to bear weight, um, and not just limp, but really it's able to bear weight or not able to bear weight. Uh, limp's really not in, in, the, in the equation there. Um, fever and ESR and a white count. And then there's a modified criteria now that CRP is widely available, so CRP has been added into this. Um, and then depending on if you have one, two, three, or four of these criteria met, um, you can, you can uh, determine the, the likelihood of having a septic arthritis. So if you have all four of those, you have like a 99% chance that you're going to have septic arthritis. Um, the most important out of those clinically are going to be fever, and then by way of labs, it's going to be the CRP. And then Using also the modified criteria, probably the most important then is the refusal to bear weight and the elevated CRP gives you like a 75% chance of having a septic arthritis. And then, of course, don't forget blood cultures. You're taking blood anyway, so you got to send the blood cultures. Now, when talking about the you know, imaging in diagnosis of septic arthritis, um, you know, usually you get x-rays, and that's primarily because you're ruling out other stuff. You're ruling out trauma because it's not always a clear-cut picture. Um, but typically, they're not super helpful. Um, ultrasound, again, to me, is not very helpful. It's often done, but really all it tells me is, it, when we're talking about a hip septic arthritis, is that there's fluid there. It doesn't tell me if it's, you know, fluid from pus or just a synov uh, synovial fluid from a toxic synovitis or maybe a hemarthrosis in a, a hemophiliac. Um, and then there's always the big question of, do we do the MRI or not? Um, there are pros and cons to an MRI when a kid is presenting like this in the emergency room. The pros are, if there's any question about the diagnosis, it can be really helpful in determining, is this a, is this a septic hip versus maybe like a psoas abscess or something else going on. If it's not the typical clinical picture, it's helpful. Um, it can also be helpful if you think there is a femoral neck osteomyelitis in conjunction with this. 
The bad part about it is it can waste time, and we'll talk about some of why that's important, but with every passing minute, you could be risking damage, permanent damage to the cartilage when you have an infection in a joint. Um, and you guys know through the ER especially, sometimes it can be like a logistical nightmare to get the MRI done. And then oftentimes, unless you're, as an orthopedist, we're sitting right in the MRI machine. You know, these kids often, they're young, they gotta be anesthetized for the MRI. Unless we're sitting right there with them while they're under anesthesia and can really make like a game time call in the MRI suite to go to the OR, oftentimes they'll have to be woken up, brought back to the ER, and then brought to the OR if needed. So it can be like a second anesthetic. And then when we're talking about septic arthritis that's not in the hip, we approach it a little bit differently just because of access. So the hip is a deep joint. It's very difficult to aspirate it like without some type of imaging. Um, but these other joints are superficial, and, you're, and so the, you're going to see an effusion, you're going to feel an effusion, and you can get to an effusion with a needle, and we're going to practice some of that later on today as well. Um, they're going to be, uh, they're going to have restricted motion that's going to be very painful, and it's not um, like restricted motion like you see in a Lyme arthritis where it, they can move it, they can, Lyme arthritis, say, of the knee, they can move the knee um, within a certain range, and then it's limited just by the actual volume, but within that m limited motion, it's not super painful. Uh, a septic arthritis, say, of the knee, is when any range of motion of the knee is going to be painful. Sometimes, it, you know, oftentimes it will be warm because, again, it's a more superficial joint. Um, and then plus or minus on the uh, redness or surrounding cellulitis, oftentimes you don't see that. And so when we're not talking about the hip, the, the gold standard of diagnosis is to uh, aspirate it, get the fluid out. Um, and when we get the fluid out, we get the synovial fluid, we send it for analysis, and probably the most important thing we're looking at there is gonna be the cell count with the differential. We always send it for the gram stain, it's only really positive. Uh, even if even, you know, you're sending the lab frank pus and you know that this is an infection, it's really, the gram stain is only positive, maybe like the reports are 30 to 60% of the time. And then you also send that synovial fluid for culture, um, and then I think Dr. Gagliardi is going to get a little bit more into this, but if they're younger kids, we send it for Kingella PCR uh, because that's a more common causative agent in young kids. Um, and I think she's going to go a bit more into detail about that, which is really important. Um, and when we get these cell counts and everything back, or, or really when we, get the, when we do the aspiration, I think what's under or overlooked a bit sometimes, which is really helpful to me, is just what does it look like? So oftentimes if the ER is doing the aspiration, I love it when they take a picture and send it to me because I can tell you almost right away whether it's going to be a bacterial infection or not just by the appearance of it. Um, so if they send me a picture and it's this milky stuff, I'm canceling my plans and getting ready to go to the OR. Um, then the cell count comes back, it's over 50,000 with a predominance of uh, white cells with that. And then again, the gram stain, not super helpful. We always get it. It's always, it's nice. It's like a little bit of uh, extra confidence boost if it's positive, but oftentimes it's not very useful. And the treatment for this, why do we care about it? it you know, the treatment is really get the pus out. That's number one. Um, and the reason is th this is a surgical emergency is because within about eight hours, the bacteria, the enzymes that they produce will start to degrade the cartilage. And if you think about that eight hours, that's eight hours from the time that the parents then thought it was bad enough to contact the pediatrician or the ER. Uh, they get them in, they have to get registered, they have to get the blood drawn, they have to get all this stuff, the blood has to come back from the lab. All, the clock's ticking throughout this entire time. That's, so it is a true surgical emergency. Um, and then the second arm of treatment here, probably you know, equally as important, are antibiotics. And we like for antibiotics to be held uh, as long as the kid is stable, they're not septic systemically, uh, because then we can get good uh, information from cultures about uh, what to target. And I always get pediatric infectious disease involved. Um, they know a lot more about this stuff than I do, um, uh, so I trust their opinion on it. Um, and the reason we're so concerned about this and why we treat this as such an emergency is because we want to avoid these 
terrible late complications, post-infectious arthritis. The hip on the left here, oh, this doesn't come up. The hip on the left here, you see it's nice and spherical. It's nice and round. It fits right into the cup beautifully. The one on the right here has this divot out of it. It's looking a little bit like, a, like jagged edges here. This doesn't bode well for this hip long term. Uh, long standing untreated, they can actually get a hip dislocation. Then you can also get things like avascular necrosis and growth arrest, growth, growth disturbance. Bottom line is bad things for all these kids. Now, often confused and sometimes a bit tough to parse out, um, and it's always the question, is this toxic synovitis or is this a septic hip? And this is the most common cause of hip pain in, in a child. And this is truly like the limping child. Kids are usually a little bit older and they have a bit more of a subacute presentation. Um, oftentimes you can get a history of a viral illness within the last couple of weeks. Um, they usually will walk, but just with a limp. And, uh, you know, of course, they oftentimes will get the typical septic arthritis workup, which includes labs. And the labs can be a little confusing sometimes. Usually the white count's normal, but oftentimes with the septic hip it is. Um, they may have, like, a little bit of a bump in their ESR and CRP, but it's not usually as high as with a true bacterial infection. And sometimes they can even have this low-grade fever. So it can create a, a little bit of a confusing picture. Uh, but usually by the time you're examining them, uh, that, that's what really makes the difference there. Um, and so for treatment of that, it's just anti-inflammatories. Um, and so if they're in your office, if they're in your ER, usually just one dose, you monitor them for an hour or two, and you will almost always see at least some improvement. Uh, maybe not completely resolved, but it's going to get better, whereas a bacterial septic joint won't get better with one dose of uh, NSAIDs. And then most of them are completely gone in 48 hours with around-the-clock anti-inflammatory. Sometimes it can take up to a week, so we don't get too, too worried if they still come in three, four days later with a little bit of complaints. Um, and then, of course, they just, it's really about parent education, making sure that there's, they know what to come back for, what to look out for. Um, just a couple words on osteomyelitis is going to be touched on in the next talk. But uh, it's almost always metaphyseal in kids. And the reason is because there's some unique characteristics about the blood supply in the femoral or in the uh, uh, metaphysis of kids where these capillaries come in and they take this hairpin loop. And if you get a transient bacteremia, say from even up to 30% of the time, it's just from a simple trauma, um, they can get kind of clogged up in this region. There's also low pH here, which breeds... Uh, uh, the bacteria. And then there are four joints that are intracapsular, uh, that have an intracapsular metaphysis. So this area here connects directly with the joint, and that's in the hip, the shoulder, the ankle, and the elbow. And so you can get these osteomyelitis, which if they are this kind of smoldering thing, they can break into the joint and then progress present as a bit more of an acute situation with that septic arthritis. And again, the treatment is the exact same. It's really to just get the pus out, do the antibiotics. The workup for a, a, a osteo with a septic joint is maybe sometimes a little different in that we might push the MRI a little bit more. And that really has to do with the history being maybe like a little bit more of a longer and indolent course that kind of got a bit more severe acutely. Um, we can always get the MRI later, though, if need be. The first thing to do is, is treat the emergency. Um, so, you know, in summary, the differential diagnosis of a limp is, is there's too many to count. Um, taking a good history, doing a good clinical examination, those are the key things. Uh, if you're concerned about infection, it needs a quick workup. We need to make quick decisions because if you do find a septic arthritis, it really is a surgical emergency. Questions?